In recognition of Black History Month, TNG honors historically Black colleges and universities in this country that were founded to provide a way for African Americans to obtain a college degree when African Americans were not allowed to attend predominantly white institutions. Each historically Black college and university has its own unique rich history, and that continues to add to this country's fabric in the education system today. Today, we honor Southern University at Shreveport, located in Shreveport, Louisiana, and I have joining me from Southern uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator, Title IX Coordinator, ADA Coordinator. I'm not sure she's a whole bunch of different coordinators, but I welcome Dr. Janetta Banks from Southern. Dr. Banks, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you today? I am doing well. Thank you. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about Southern? Okay, so Southern was actually developed or, or came into place in the 1800s. So it was 1880, March 9th. So we will be celebrating come next month um, just the, the development of the, uh, the name Southern University. Um, and so our first campus, which was Southern University at New Orleans, um, was actually developed by African-Americans political leaders at the time, PBS Pinchback, uh, Theophile Elaine, and Mr. Henry DeMoss. Uh, they actually attended the Louisiana State Con Constitutional Convention. And from there, they proposed to higher education that we need a school that will actually provide education to people of color. So from there, there was actually the beginning beginning of the name Southern University. Um, so of course, you know, when we start to think about history, that was right before the Civil War. So Louisiana had also established the free class of the people of color. Um, and so with that, they already had property owners. So those property owners provided their land in order for us to develop the Southern University of New Orleans. If I recall correctly, you are also the graduate of Grambling University. So tell me about that experience from a student perspective. So from a student perspective, the first day I actually enrolled, I had no idea what I was going to get. I went to class. And I remember Miss Medrick Gallo, we call her the mother of Grambling. Mm -hmm. And she took all of us under her wing. Um, actually, her son right now is the president of Grambling State University. Um, just to show you how rich their history is, um, they had a business that was there um, that provided free haircuts to students that were getting ready to go on jobs interviews and and making sure that they were prepared but I remember sitting in her class and as a student I remember her telling us today is going to be the first day of change and I'm sitting here the first day of change I mean yeah we're, we're going to school I mean yeah she was like no this is the first day of changing your life this is the first day of building your foundation. And from there, I mean, she would stand by the door and critique us with how we came to class. Mm. If you didn't comb your hair, if you came in with pants sagging, pants dirty, wrinkled, she would say, that is not how you present yourself go back and change and come back to class. Cause you had her for an hour and 50 minutes. Mm. So you had time to go and change and get it together. <laughs> and she would wait. And I mean, if she had to send you back and you took longer than what she expected, you walk in there, she would say, huh, it took you 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. You gotta do better. <laughs> I like that. And we would sit in there. If you slouch, she would say, no, sit straight up. Let them know that you are in here for business. Look them in their eyes. Talk to them. 
as if you want somebody to talk back to you. Re give them that same respect. Mm -hmm. And from there, I was like, okay, I, all right. This, mm -hmm. this is truly a new beginning. I was happy that my mom said, you are going to HBCU because I never had intentions on going to HBCU. My mother had the intentions. Uh, my mother's uh, my mother is a graduate of HBCU. My um, she's also a graduate of Grambling. My uncle, on the other hand, is a graduate of Southern University. Okay. So um, I was split. I always tell people I'm split, especially when we go to Bayou Classic. Um, so I have to now wear a Grambling and a, a, a Southern University shirt, so I'm a fine one. But with that, I had to learn that everything that my mom had done was instilling something in me. And I did not understand a lot of that until I went to personally start working for predominantly white institutions. Okay. And from there is where I start to learn that what Miss Gallo instilled in us, we needed that, but it's not that we needed it to help us because it did help us, but we needed it. We needed that because we were going to pave the way for those that came behind us. Mm. And so it made me appreciate going to HBCU because I, what I learned is in working in predominantly white institutions and I, it didn't matter how educated we were, mm -hmm. our value of education was not the same compared to those that went to Harvard, Penn State, uh, or they went to using the University of Texas system, the UTAs. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, it didn't matter that I was highly educated or even went on to get a doctorate. I remember my dean telling me, um, looking me dead in the face and saying, but your speech is not good enough. Mm -hmm. You don't use, it's not again, it's a game. I need you to understand that. You need to make sure that it's subject verb agreements. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. you will never be promoted in this system mm -hmm. if you don't understand this. Wow. Again, here it was, I've been working for years in higher education and I get to a point where I'm trying to get promoted and my own dean is telling me that you're not good enough to get to the next level. And I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. we're still here. Mm -hmm. And so from there, I've always been a person, you tell me I can't have, I'm going to push. I'm it. going to find a way to get it. Um, I tell my children that all the time. If someone says no, then you keep trying the next door because there is going to be a yes. And it only takes that one yes. Mm -hmm. So I don't care how many no's you get. Mm -hmm. You look and you keep searching for that yes. And so that's something that I apply in my daily life. That's something that I apply with every student I get or every student that I talk to. Every time I step into a classroom and I teach, I apply that because there are going to be plenty of no's, mm -hmm. but you still continue to search for that yes. If you have one um, one statement that you could share, which describes the need for us as a country to make sure that we are funding historically Black colleges and universities at the same rate and level that we fund uh, predominantly white institutions, what would you what, what what would you share in terms of why historically Black colleges and universities are so important in today's education environment and landscape? So for one, HBCUs are, I call them budget-friendly. Mm -hmm. 
and they're budget friendly because it allows students or, or people of color to go to school at sometimes 30% less than our white counterparts. And so that's one thing. I, I know that they've continued to cut our budgets, but we have to continue to fight. Those that are, are HBCU alums, it's time for us to come out of retirement and we need to fight. Don't get me wrong. I know that there is a income gap when it comes to, do, come to those of us that have attended HBCUs. However, I do think that it's time for us to fight because our degrees may not seem like a lot to others, but our degrees matter. We fought for those. Mm -hmm. And our educators, they fought to be there to provide that to us. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that it's necessary for us to recognize that while we're not graduating at high percentage of ratings, but that 20% that we offer, mm -hmm. I think that it's it's definitely necessary. Another thing that it offers is it provides for low income families okay. to attend school and get their education because of that fractional cost. Mm -hmm. So it's getting, if you don't want to send your school, fund our schools so that those students can go to school, so that they can provide. Because as we know, the middle class is still behind because of that, that wealth gap. So with us being behind, allow us to be able to go to school and be able to get what we need so that we can start to climb. But it's also necessary that once we get those degrees, provide us with that, that gap, close that gap mm -hmm. so that we can get the, the funding or the income that we need to take care of our families and to pay our student loans. Mm -hmm. Because as we know, most middle class, whether you black or white, cannot afford to pay student loans yep. because of the income gap. And it's even worse for women that have gone to school because we, if there's a dollar, we're only getting 50 cents to the dollar versus a man who's getting the dollar. Mm -hmm. So there's another gap that sometimes we don't even talk about. That So it, it's a lot because as we know, most of the time, it's the woman that is pushing to go back to school to better herself. And here it is. Now she's trying to get back. She's trying to fight for for making up the gap. And if she's having to take out student loans, if she didn't qualify for a Pell Grant, if she, or if she need additional funding. Mm -hmm. So it, it's that part. Um, and then the HBCU within itself foster success. Um, for the low income families. Um, we're actually not only providing the, the people of color uh, the chance to go to school, but we're also providing them with the support that they need mm -hmm. um, and allowing them to have that, that freedom of speech within the HBCU um, because they feel welcome when they walk there because this is someone that actually looked like them. Sure. This is someone that gets a chance to say, you know what, I, I understand that you do have that gap, but let me show you how to get to the next level. Le next level, I'm sorry. Let me guide you. Um, because what we look at, HBCUs have been providing education for over 150 years. Mm -hmm. But we're also the least to, to actually be promoted. So I challenge all of our HBCUs to go out and do more promotion, because if you're not putting the word out that you are there, then yes, our, our enrollment is going to, I'm sorry, continue to decline because we are not promoting 
ourselves like we should. You know, I always tell people every time I turn on a on the television or even a radio, you hear about our predominantly white institutions advertising and advertising and advertising. And I'm like, wow, they do a lot of advertisement. Where are all of our HBCU advertisements? Why are we not, every time you turn it on the TV, seeing a HBCU in the area doing a lot of advertising? Why are we not doing that? And so we're losing our own students because we're not advertising. They don't know what we offer. So it's a must that we get out there and fight for our people so that we can truly provide our people of color with education. Because when I tell you they need it, that they need us, they need us. And we also have to understand that when attending a HBCU, it's providing us because remember, we are rooted in faith community and services. Our HBCUs were built on the church. Mm -hmm. We got to go back to the drawing board of providing those services and providing those welcoming, those welcoming conversations to say our doors are open. Yeah, absolutely. So well, that's what we need. Right. You are fine. No need to apologize. Um, you have just shared a wealth of information that uh, was truly inspiring and valuable information that I think uh, is more than deserving of making sure that we continue to push the message of the importance of HBCUs and the legacy that they have and continue to have and will have in the future um, as long as we continue. Yes make sure that we are doing what we need to do to highlight and show the need for our HBCUs, historically Black colleges and universities, to continue to, to move strong in educating um, African-American students just across the country. Uh, I want to thank you. I appreciate your time. I know this uh, has been a busy day for, for you, um, as well as I'm yeah. sure a busy month. Um, but I would like to close by saying we appreciate what you and your colleagues are doing at Southern University and it is definitely our honor at TNG to highlight Southern University and all your many institutions. So we'll just go with the system. Yes, <laughs> uh, the system. Yes. The system as a part of our uh, Black History Month program. And thank you again. Thank you.